So, hello and welcome to this Carved in Blue Denim Think Tank webinar. My name is Michael Kinnamanth and I will be your moderator today. Um, just some housekeeping reminders before we start. Um, we will be recording this webinar today and it will be uploaded to our Blue Lens video channel on YouTube. So if you have friends or colleagues who couldn't get to watch this live, you can direct them there. Um, also, if you have any questions that you'd like to put to the panel, please type them in the Q&A box and we will attempt to fit them in at the end of the webinar. Um, today, uh, we're aiming to do about one hour, but we, we, may, we may run over if, um, if uh, there's enough interest in, in the Q&A. Um, okay. So, the, the subject of this webinar today is a, a bit of a departure for us, um, because it's not primarily focused on denim, where we, we've been putting our efforts over the last few weeks. Our discussion today is centered around education in the fashion and apparel industry. Um, a broad topic, I think you'll agree, and probably way too much to discuss in one webinar. However, we'll give it a good go. So does education need the same reset as the industry is talking about? Did education need to change even before the outbreak of the pandemic? Are old values and traditional knowledge and skills redundant? Or, or do we need to return to them? Are we in different time now, um, where the expectations from students are different from uh, students of 10 years ago? Are the expectations of brands and retailers different? I personally have been in the industry over 45 years. Uh, when I was studying textiles, technical knowledge was valued by the industry, by the whole supply chain. Um, brands and retailers had departments of textile specialists. Um, sadly today, uh, brands and retailers seem to have divested themselves of such departments and they rely significantly on the supply chain to support them all things technical. Which brings me neatly around to the title of our webinar. Um, last year I gave a talk to a large group of students and beginners in the industry and I was stressing the need to be an all-rounder in terms of textile and apparel knowledge when it came to getting on in your career, and that learning about things outside of your speciality should be an essential pursuit. Um, I went on to give them some examples of questions I'd been asked by senior people at brand and retail level, questions which were shockingly at a level of high school student knowledge. Um, during the coffee break afterwards, somebody came up to me and relayed a story to me that whilst working at a well-known UK brand, they'd been asked this question by a senior manager, what kind of sheep does cotton come from? <laughs> so my initial reaction was to think, we are doomed. We are doomed if this is the level of knowledge in our industry. You know, how low can we go? Uh, and it would be funny if it wasn't so serious. Um, and I think, unfortunately, nowadays, discussions at trade shows that I have between myself and supply chain partners regularly comes around to the fact that textile knowledge in the supply chain, especially at brand and retail level, is shockingly low. Yet, um, a few direct experiences I have had with textile and fashion colleges and schools in the last 18 months to two years have really only been enlightening and uplifting with fully engaged students producing inspired pieces of work. So the question is, what is happening between academia and industry? Where is the mismatch? What can be done about it? So in order to discuss this and more, uh, we brought together an esteemed panel from all over the UK, all of whom have had careers in both academia and industry, and so are well qualified to bring an informed perspective on this subject. Um, the panel consists of Zoe Broach from Royal College of Art, 
Sue Barrett from Denim Forum, Mohsin Sajid from Denim History and Endrime, uh, Gabby Shiner Hill from Ravensbourne University, and Stella Claxton from Nottingham Trent University. So, without further ado, I'll get on to the first question. And the first question, and uh, Sue, hopefully you can you can start with this. Does the design role exist anymore, or have Pinterest and Instagram replaced the need to hire fashion designers? Over to you, Sue. Thank you very much. Uh, I well, I I think when I when I read this question initially, my initial res response was to really think about what it would have been like had I been straight out of college, because essentially that's sort of what we're, we're referring to is how much knowledge, how much training do you need to get those skills? And I, I think that because there is such a, a higher expectation nowadays when students leave college that they, they should be market ready. Uh, I think not having had those experiences, not having somebody to mentor you through the processes really puts designers on the firing line. Um, so from that perspective, uh, I would say, yes, anybody can sort of like create their own beautiful Pinterest board. Anybody can create uh, something from pulling stuff, but it's the filtering processes. It's the mentoring processes. It's the nurturing in terms of like, this is, this is our target consumer or having those kind of reference discussions, have ex having experience of seeing how that might have worked, how that might have been played out. Those are all of the, um, the sort of, I guess, the filters or the settings that I think you need to have experienced in the real world. Um, and I wouldn't expect that designers would come straight out of college, uh, even emotionally ready to be like part of that sort of level of responsibility. So uh, as much as everybody should and could have a beautiful Pinterest board of, of, of everything that they need in their life, it is around having filters that basically say, yes, that's absolutely beautiful, but it's just not viable. Or, uh, and I think it, it takes a, you know, it's like, there's no I in team. It's, it's about the teamwork effort of things that make things work. And I think those things can be very much overlooked uh, these days in the urgency to save money and to just get things faster. So I don't know if I very indirectly answered that question, but that's essentially what came up when I was thinking of that question was like, effectively, everyone can research anything, but it's the filtering process and the mentoring and the auditing and editing process that requires a bit more handholding and a bit more structure. So, I mean, another aspect to this is, um, and maybe Stella, you can start on this. Um, I, I've seen multiple times where the design process is a buyer with a garment from another brand going to the regional office and say, can you copy this for this price? And that's the, that's bypassing completely the designer. So w what is the design role today, do you think? Um, let me just see if I can understand you correctly there, Michael. So are you saying that potentially because of, um, uh, say, the buyer taking control of that process, they've got a garment, they're going to take it, what, to a supplier to get them to copy it? They take it to a supplier or they take it to their own regional office to find a supplier. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, I know I'm generalising here, but I'm, I'm really talking about the mass market things. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things, that I'm, I'm going to come back to what Sue's just said here, I think the process of designing for that market, whoever is doing it, is about that thing that, that Sue's just described, which is researching information and, and whether it's the designer or the buyer, and the buyer, there's a, bit, there's a lot of crossover in these roles as well. Um, but, you know, in, in traditional mass market, the designer may be that person who is... Um, researching all those trends they're doing it within a framework of the brand the consumer and the trend and it's got to be commercial so there is as sue just said there's a lot of experience that that kind of you know if you're just coming out of university you're not going to have that commercial now 
to really apply that in in the best way for your for your customer so there is a skill and there's an element of creativity in in interpreting those trends for that consumer and i think it's very important that i mean designers are coming out with you know hopefully great ideas and great approaches and excitement and energy and using maybe the more experienced designers in the team to provide that mentoring almost as sue just described it so you've got a balance because those those more experienced designers will also have that understanding the commercial understanding of how to take that trend and make it relevant for their consumer so although we're not talking about the kind of creativity in the sense of making and concept development and experimentation there is a skill to that process you know at the commercial level of the market in my opinion um, and it's difficult to do that from a standing start without that that sort of support that sort of commercial support and knowledge now in a lot of these companies the, the bar this this crosses over with some of what the buyer's role is so again as sue's just mentioned you know when you're in a company that's maybe you know sort of um struggling for budgets or financially pressurized it may well be that decisions are made about the makeup of your overall team uh, design is a multidisciplinary thing you've got you know, nobody can have all the skills and knowledges to develop a product you know you, you you'd be a very unusual person if you had in-depth creative knowledge in-depth making in-depth ability to innovate in-depth scientific knowledge it, it's just not possible so what tends to happen is that designers go into roles go into companies and those initial jobs that they have possibly determine how they develop through their career so for instance i started off in manufacturing as a designer so i developed very deep technical knowledge and has it's kind of informed my career path all the way along but if you go into a more high-end brand you know you'd be maybe more creative you develop that side of your your um skill so um sorry i don't know if i've got a bit off the, off the track here no i, I um, and, and so, maybe i was gonna say maybe gabby could come in here um i'll go back in my in my day when i would look in the back of draper's record there are very specific jobs, you know, garment tech, fabric tech, designer, whatever. And now brands and retailers seem to be looking for this person who are, is multi-skilled. So somebody with very little experience coming out of um, academia is expected to maybe be a designer, but um, have some element there of, of understanding buying. So how how are you dealing with that at, um, at university level? Do you do you actually try and teach that? Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I think it goes it goes a little bit back to the beginning question around Pinterest and also then taking a garment to your buying office and saying, can you make me this but five cents cheaper than you did last year? Um, and I think it comes down to ownership and students understanding where the images and where the ideas and where their research comes from. So we teach a fashion buying course and some of our students cross over a little bit into the design sphere, but it's on the product development and design side, not conceptual design development, which is what is taught on the design courses. So what we're teaching our buying students and they want to be buyers, product developers, merchandisers, visual merchandisers, is we're trying to teach them the like the validity of their research and the validity of a true and a real source but so pinterest is not a valid source for us you can make a great board but it is irrelevant unless you know where all those images come from and you can credit the correct person um, and also taking a garment and saying make me this but five cents cheaper is irrelevant because that what, what we're teaching someone just to copy something else so what you could you know what's the what is the benefit of studying for three years to learn how to copy someone else's work it's it's not relevant we know that the industry are doing it and we know they're doing it because they want speed to market and they want to keep up with their competitors but there's it doesn't make sense that we teach that side of it um, we need to show them that that's what people 
um, and brands do do at certain points, but we also have to show them how to create really good research trends and concepts from scratch themselves so that then they can come in with valid ideas and their own um, research as opposed to saying, well, this person did this and it's selling, so we should do that also. So that's my response. Okay, so Mohsin, I would say, you know, you are steeped in practical ideas and translating things practically in terms of design and construction that that's your thing um yeah i read you know i've i've read articles about things being produced purely digitally and somebody on blockchain actually investing into that digital thing just buying a digital product uh, those two things seem to be light years apart. So, how how do you view things? Um, well, well, I you know um, I got taught just I got taught in a in a very like traditional way of doing research and pattern cutting and design. So yeah, I've come from that sphere, and obviously I have been in like situations where um, brands often give me at the beginning of the season a PDF with fifty designs, and they say we want a version of this, and if you deviate from it you get in trouble. So, you know, so those roles and they're big, big companies that do that still because they want to make sure that they hit the mark and only about 10% or maybe 5% if you're lucky can be the wild card that you can design in your heart's desire and they won't affect it too much. But um, a lot of things are going like digital, of course. So, you know, and the, the advent of, 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 in, of like um, Instagram as well has changed everything. So, you know, Pinterest, yes. I often, I remember speaking to a buyer or might have been a merchandiser telling me, uh, Mohsen, I, I don't, I don't like your idea because I didn't see it in Pinterest. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You know, they said it, they, I, didn't, I didn't find it on the internet. So it can't be, it can't be that good. And I was like, oh no, no. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, so it's a bit of a, of a problem. Um, still is, a, still is a problem, big, big time. But then, yeah, you know, I often get students, cause I teach as well, that they do just cut and paste from the internet, like someone else's mood board. And you can see, going, how, and they ask them questions because you know about the designer and they don't know anything. Some of them don't know anything about it. So there's a, there's, there's some cut and paste going on, but then the, there are some good people that do do the research and tell you, and it leads them to other research. That's what's good about researching is it leads you to other things. And you can tell someone got inspired by that one image and they found 15 other things that inspired them and it led to something else. So, um, but your question, sorry, Michael, you've deviated so much already, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, the whole digital thing, yeah, they are, they are like digital avatars now. Lots of brands are doing it where they're trying to, instead of buying that garment, you can buy a digital version of it and you can put your face on it. And, you know, because especially in China and those kind of places, it's very much about looking cool or, or they only give out a certain amount of these like digital mm. avatars. So if you get it, then you've, you've, got, you've, got exclusive, you've got exclusivity on this image or this virtual garment. So there is a lot of other, but I see it more in the Far East, not so much in Europe yet. So, yeah, I don't know. Zoe, I just add really quickly, just add something to what you were saying, Mossin, because I know that when I started in the industry, in the denim industry, it was still very much, uh, you were working with pattern cutters. So you had your concept, you were working with a pattern cutter, you were working essentially more as an atelier. What a lovely concept. Um, but you were creating a beautiful product in, 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 a, brand, uh, in a branded environment, which is a much slower environment, than the game changer that happened when Zara came into the market, which was a, a clearly defining moment. Um, and uh, so the knowledge that you needed was very different because you were working as a designer who was passionate about the design aspect alongside experts in pattern cutting, in sourcing, in all of those other areas. So you were part of a team. And so where their knowledge might have been less, yours was strong and it was very much a team, you know, people talk about collaboration nowadays and it's, you know, it's definitely not the same as it used to be. But the, it, the expectations for designers were very different. Whereas now, uh, then, then after that, I went to another company where essentially they brought uh, designers straight from college who were almost treated like photocopiers. Their role was so you know, it's so unvalued that they were sort of put in the corner and can you just copy this and like the thing that we've all experienced. And there was one girl that was super, super passionate. Every time you asked her to design something, she'll cover it with sequins. So you'd obviously have to give her the, 
the the occasion wear area to do because you know can we have a gilet with a puffer jacket sequins but you know great she's got her passion in her niche fantastic but it was it was a very different thing like literally going from like get it on the fax fax machine to hong kong and then somebody will pick up the pieces down the line but it was a massive jump from like part of a team in an atelier to then almost just a, fact, a, a photocopier in human form because you're just reproducing stuff so where did that happen mm. and what and what do we want it to be <clears throat> in the future uh, and i think that one of the great things about the slowing down of covid is like great can we just actually think about the the, the, vol the volume and what we want to create and the brand dna so potentially there is there is a way of learning from that and going okay so let's let's make you know a beautiful casserole of beautiful products in a slower time frame because mm. that doesn't need to happen so sorry i just needed to interject that as it was coming through because there was a huge huge disconnect between what i'd experienced uh, in one area and then boom straight into trying to compete in a, at a cheaper level than zara that was not nice <laughs> i think that um well, you, you make a point about uh, the slowing down and people re-looking at how we do things in the pandemic. Um, compare and contrast that to, uh, you know, a, a couple of brands in the US who, where it was rumoured that um, they don't even employ designers. They just actually interpret des design sent in by customers. And these are a couple of brands over there who've gone from nowhere to being stellar in two or three years. So um, they're the two ends of this. I mean, Zoe, do, do you welcome the fact that we've had to um, slow down and, and, and re-look at how we do things during this pandemic area in, rela in relation to uh, design? 100% yes. Um... And sort of taking on the first question and, and um, all the different answers, I wonder whether we have kind of a couple of options ahead of us. We need to look at the fact that there will be a new design role within the digital. Um, and I think this is super fascinating because it's not Pinterest and Instagram. It will be machine learning and AI that ultimately all that data has been collected by various different sites already, whether they're retailers or whoever. Um, and the truth is that that machine learning, when it gets sophisticated, which is not there as yet, um, will become able to produce design for us. But then what is that role of the designer in the future that can work in two ways, potentially, within the digital in a really expressive way, but then coming back to less and slower that maybe actually design with a, a much kind of stronger sense of material and customer and positioning the global uh, there's almost two avenues there for me that i think will could be a dramatic shift as what you refer to when zara came in and actually the time we have now is our reflection to understand how we manage that going forward whether we're education and or industry and it's not going to happen overnight but definitely we have a space where we can begin to set out the steps to become really positive so the designer doesn't get removed the designer actually returns to a real valuable uh position within the chain that would be my take yeah <clears throat> and well i think the other thing is for me and this is <clears throat> it's but this uh, goes back to my intro that i was i strongly believe that um you can't you cannot exist and just in a single discipline and only be have the knowledge about that single discipline and i think today more than ever and i'm really coming over to things related to sustainability that you know designers of today they need to understand how to design and they need to understand about um, fabrics uh, and materials but I think they need to do it in the context of sustainability. And I, I know, Stella, that you've been doing quite a lot on this. Um, is, is this something that's being taught strongly enough at academia at the moment? I think that, um, well, we are definitely, I think all of my colleagues here would agree that, you know, universities are 
you know very engaged now in in this area and trying to embed it into their programs um, I think we're in a moment of um, there's a lot there's a lot going on there's a lot of change happening and um, I think as Zoe's just said you know things are starting to emerge priorities are starting to emerge that may be you know from from the sort of, sort of seismic issues that have been going on in the world might give us a clearer path of which directions we need to go in i think what's happened up until this point is we've been in this position where the industry kind of gradually has come to the conclusion and come to the realization over the past five to ten years that it isn't sustainable in its current form mm -hmm. you know we're talking about training designers at the moment for an industry that isn't sustainable so yes obviously we've got to look at that but it's got to be sort of done in conjunction with industry and there's got to be more of a partnership i think and in, in identifying the potential directions that that are possible but all the time it's very difficult because those businesses have to uh, balance the now with the future and so those decisions about the paths we go down are really difficult to make so there's a lot of talk of circularity at the moment within the industry um, that's criticised by some academics as being too much like business as usual with a few bits bolted on or it's not um, innovative or um, it, it's not sort of disruptive enough you know that we it's maybe just too incremental that we're not going to move fast enough by that route um, I think the uh, you know there's lots of things that, that kind of have played into where we are so for instance your your comments about the lack of technical knowledge you know I think that's held us back you know there was a reason for that technical knowledge you know that sort of reduction on focus in focus on technical knowledge because technical not you know technical teaching at the time when you and I trained was to serve a, a local manufacturing industry which we don't have anymore so um, you know we had to row back on that within education because it wasn't there was no demand you know the demand diminished you know but now there is a need for technical knowledge of a different kind maybe an innovation in that new materials development you know but we are a little bit behind the curve there i think as a country you know and i think our education sector has maybe missed a trick and not been um not anticipated that need well enough and i think you know we react all the time to the pressures of the of the industry you know what they want now in terms of graduates what they feel they need now what the roles are you know are we and balancing that with what's necessary for the future is very very difficult especially when there is no kind of consensus on what these ways forward are potentially mm. um so i think education is is really kind of look at like industry is we're all looking for you know what we should be doing how we should be doing it who can we collaborate with you know we've got it's a very big complex industry it's global there's lots of different types of you know consumer groups in it with different needs and wants and understandings of and, and even kind of um you know where they are in their consumption headspace <laughs> as consumers is different all over the world and yet these global brands are having to serve all of these markets so um it's an incredibly complex picture and we're trying to find our way through it um i think we need more collaboration with industry and more honesty about the situation and the problems and how we move forward um we need more research and funding of research and i think the government needs to help with that we had that fixing fashion um, report that came out about 18 months ago after the government and environmental audit committee uh, hearings, which have gone nowhere, really. Mm. You know, there was a real opportunity there to, for, the, for the whole sort of sector in this country and education to come together to try and, you know, really find some ways forward. But that hasn't happened. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of things in the background potentially throwing that off course like brexit and now the pandemic um, but maybe this is the point as, uh, as zoe says that you know we can start finding those really key areas mm. to move forward with but it's you know it's not a clear picture we're trying to address it and we need in, you know to work with industry to get there I, can i ask i sorry to interrupt michael i wonder whether in a way um we're still talking about a lot what exists but i wonder 
and this is difficult, but there almost needs to be some investment. There's a space between industry and education. Um, I think some of the things that were said by Sue at the beginning that people come out and actually then there's, a, there's this kind of gap, which maybe they then either go into industry and then they are not using their skills and, and or vice versa. But I wonder whether there needs to be investment so that companies who are nervous about what the future is invest in kind of that space to find out and build a new mesh, a new understanding of new roles and the new knowledge like around material science, around the digital, uh, around new systems that use the innovation that comes out of schools as in out of young designers where they've got this lovely provocativeness within them this kind of lovely understanding where they have really close to that learning and utilize that provocation but in a space that's not just inside the industry inside where it gets maybe sort of dried and kind of compressed a little bit well, yeah, I think we, we've segued very well into what would have been the, um, the second question about um, collaboration be, be between industry, supply chain, our brands and retailers with academia. And um, I, I, I think in, in, uh, in my lifetime, you know, we, I've, I've been involved with different projects, but they tend to be projects created for a PhD student who tries to cram it all in over two years um, and doesn't necessarily come out with anything useful for the company that he's doing uh, on the subject that he's working on or she uh, all, all quite unsatisfactory and um, the re so I had this question does there need to be more collaboration with both the industry supply chain and brands and retailers maybe there is and i don't see it but it would seem to be an essential thing for me um what's your view on this gabby mm. yeah i i just exactly what um well what zoe was saying i was very interested in because actually where the supply chain is you've said supply chain we've said supply chain and brands and retailers so if we ask our students to go mm. and investigate the supply chain and work the supply chain Part of that means they're bypassing the brands and retailers because the brands and retailers are essentially going to the supply chain and asking the supply chain to do so much of their work for them, which is, you know, part of the issue. So it's almost like connecting the supply chain um, and our students back with the brands and retailers and actually getting them back talking again, as opposed to the brands and retailers pushing out to the supply chain, the supply chain pushing out and then just delivering back the goods that the brands and retailers have requested, but might not actually um help you know actually it's not pushing forward the product it's not pushing forward the innovation within um within sort of like those brands and retailers so i would i think that for our students to understand the supply chain is the most important thing because they might go into um a brands and retailer and if they've never experienced the supply chain they might never see it their only communication with it could be over email obviously now it will probably be through more zooms and more chats but they might never get to see that supply chain for five, maybe 10 years until they finally get to visit a factory and go, oh, that's a loom, great. Um, but it's, so if the students can really understand the raw material and the supply chain, then they've got a chance to take that sort of like the provocation they've got, look at it and say, well, why, does, why do we do it like this? And why doesn't it work like this? Or could we not do it a little bit like this? Um, they don't have the opportunity to do that right now um outside they do their final major project with us in their third year we're a ba but then they don't have an opportunity to explore that anymore unless they want to set up a business which is a very big undertaking to walk out of a ba and then um, set up your own um, business um, so i think connecting with and understanding the supply chain is the most important part for our students so that they can then see where the problems are um, as opposed to just connecting with the brands and retailers which have embedded the problems and not necessarily on purpose but work work um sorry i'm trying to be careful with my words but essentially <laughs> work those problems into the system and keep it going in like a bit of a circle um can i come back and say something here sorry to um, interrupt but i think uh, I, I think this is incredibly important and um, when i started teaching um, 10 years ago I was quite shocked actually at how little the supply chain was discussed or talked about we tend to teach from the perspective of a brand 
I teach on fashion business courses. We, te we teach from the perspective of the brand all the time. Whereas when I was at university, because it was, um, you know, we used to manufacture, you had the supply chain, you know, the supply of the manufacturer's perspective very strongly in there, in the mix as well. Um, and I think there is an image problem of the supply chain with students and also with lecturers probably as well. You know, I think a lot of lecturers have never really been to a factory maybe um, or, or even engaged much with the supply chain. So, um, you know, there, and the supply chain itself, the companies, I mean, they're perceived as potentially as being a bit you know, lacking profile, low profile. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe they, the students perceive them as being kind of places that are technical rather than creative. Um, you know, that there's not opportunity to be innovative or strategic or anything because of the way that we, they perceive factories and sweatshops and the way it's discussed in terms of the global um, industry, um, that it's got a real image issue. You know, and, and actually in some cases, suppliers don't help themselves because they don't have decent websites that kind of big themselves up and kind of explain their businesses. Um, you know, students first, first thing when they're kind of trying to research anything is I look for their website, the company's website, you know, and it, it's, there's a real missed opportunity, I think, to bring to the supply chain into, uh, in, into our teaching more. Um, and, and, you know, to get you know, the students excited about what's possible because there's so many benefits of working in, for a supplier or a manufacturer because you get to engage with the product on a much more direct level, you know, and have the opportunity to do more creative problem solving um, and see maybe a variety of different customers to, to work with. Um, and just going back to your, your point, Michael, about your earlier point about buyers taking yeah. things for suppliers, that's fine if there's a designer working for the supplier. You know, a lot of, a lot of retailers will, you know, put some of their designs out to those suppliers who've got really good design teams and can interpret, you know, ideas or come up with new ideas that they haven't thought of or bought or put in front of them. That does happen too, you know. So there's a lot of design talent potentially in that supply chain that, that we forget about. I, I had a very little part in the, um, the, the denim related course that you run at Ravensbourne. And um, you run it for, for 10 weeks or one semester, I don't know exactly what. But really that for me was a real eye opener because those students were immersed in one subject and I could see how as an industry employer that I could pick somebody from there and not necessarily oven ready but they would have they would have skills absolutely what I need so so that as far as I could see was a collaboration where people from industry were brought in to mentor these students. And I think that that was a real strong model, how things could be made more relevant for the supply chain in the industry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, it was, um, that's a very like sort of like unique sort of project. Most um, BA courses that I te teach at, that particular denim module probably only lasts two weeks, if you're lucky, or one and a half weeks. Right? So the one at Ravensbourne involves three different courses so not just fashion design fashion promotion and also um it's fashion um, accessories textile features fashion you, buying and fashion design there you go so gabby's involved and, and it's not not just me I, i'm just one of the pawns in this project and yes i i do help to get i do help uh, get the clout for the for all the people that sponsor the project and that's what's amazing about it is most sponsorship most um design courses that have outside industry help the industry expects a kickback in some ways or they expect the students to provide them with merchandising or they help them with their marketing basically but the ones that we get involved in them i do a similar one at the rca as well with um kaihara denim as well they've been helping the rca for nearly six years now and and uh, that's going to become hopefully bigger but the the ravensbourne course is actually is, is is like humongous i've never seen anything like it and it's it's involving more than 100 different students across three different courses um, each of them are put together, so it's not just a group that has just solid designers. There's one designer, 
one merchandiser, one, one. So the, the group is put together and sometimes they're put together not because they're friends, they're put together randomly. So it's a bit like how, how industry is where you get, you get into a team and you realize that one of the guys you don't get on with very well or whatever it is. So it's very much that same mechanic. And they have 10 weeks to not only design a brand, but also put it to market and do all the social media for it and, and all the sourcing for it as well. So, and then, yeah, we get industry men, mentors coming in every week to mentor them. And at the end, there's a, a, a judging. And Kingpin's actually also help with that project as well. So those winning students get to show their, get to present their work in a really amazing show with the industry. So it's a very unique project. And I'm very lucky to be a part of it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, if more people did, it would be amazing. But oh, there's many courses. I, I did a denim, the denim based project at Westminster that only lasted a week and a half. And that inspired me a big time. So if, if you just get the right tutor and the right mentorship, that's the main thing. And, and sometimes having that right person that inspires you can lead to many, many things. That's what I think. So, yeah. <laughs> Zoe, have you got any view on this? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, though, what I think um, was powerful about what you did at Ravensbourne was it was a team. So there are these slightly different perspectives of learning, but coming through the fact that it's around fashion. And I think this uh, uh, is, I mean, I don't have that so much at the, at the Royal because we're one program with many. So they do another project called Grand Challenge where they'll bring... Um, textile, fashion, design product, innovation, design engineers together. And then they are put into teams, not out of choice. And the same thing, you're learning about sociality, communication, all those other elements beyond your practice. And then how then ideas are formed between people that have different knowledge bases. So I think this is really a crucial part of learning within education that's very powerful and can be very uncomfortable <laughs> it doesn't always work um uh, and we have to be prepared in education and in industry to kind of maybe create those um situations that would be interesting so what you've done at ravensbourne from a ba to an ma but again i come back to this space between education and industry that maybe again if if there was an investment somehow whether it's government local um industry but this development a place where you bring teams together and going forward um, i'm interested in yeah like someone who comes purely from economy and can look at systems and economics and someone who comes from digital and coding and yeah i mean i just think there's a i think the core of what was great that mawson loved what he described was about team so it's about that kind of team but also new types of teams is my nutshell because I, I mean, essentially, we also forget, and you know, this is definitely going on for me at college. It's like for some kids that have just moved out from their family unit and they're, you know, struggling with lots of. We didn't work in teams when I was at college. I would have loved to have worked in a team. That would have been great. But you know, there's there's so much, so many things that are going on for all those individual students that even though sometimes your team is not your chosen, you know, your, your fam. It, it's I think it's absolutely essential to learn all of that stuff but it also holds at a time where we're actually so much has been fallen apart and in uh, in in a, in a work environment it's great when you have a good team of people but it doesn't always happen it's not always you don't always land the ideal mm -hmm. um, I think so, what happened was um, also like some of the teams you know the, the 15 or so groups one or two of them weren't just weren't that successful they some of them didn't get on or some of them didn't yeah. turn up. So, and the one and one or two of them had to do all of the work and they felt the pressure of it. And I was like, that's how it is in industry sometimes. You have to pick up the pace to make sure you do you actually deliver at the end, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. And the next question is, how do we balance educating for the industry needs with educating for personal and societal societal good within fashion education so um i think this possibly was something that you brought in zoe so maybe you start with that i mean i think to begin with because coming back to your first question to me about this space i think both education and industry are not perfect and both have to change. So it's not about being ready and need for industry and or just for education. I think we have to really, again, I come back to this word about values. I think we're at a very, very crucial point of learning in our planet um, about people, about um, 
sustainable issues. And I think what's important is that we, we, feel, we feel strongly in education that we're not just preparing people for what exists, we're preparing people who are willing to make, take the uncomfortable questions forward. So it's not being unrealistic, it's understanding. They have to understand what's there. I think it would be wrong for us to teach, to just prepare people to move into it perfectly. I think we have to prepare people and I think education is the most phenomenal part of your life. I also think education is not just for when you're young, FYI. I think that's for all of us at different stages. And maybe all of us now need to consider that um, as we move forward to learn new things. But we have to, I think it's going to be an uncomfortable period ahead of us. And I think we need to educate ourselves and be part of that, which is... Um, I guess in the end, it's about personal choices. If you understand who you are, you can begin to understand your values. So it, it's, teaching fashion is not going to be the same as it was. It shouldn't be. It should start with the very human and the very kind of molecular. And it should also be positioned in the fact that in 2020, our bandwidth of knowledge is intensely able to be much more complex. So we have to step up to that place. So I, I read about uh, a lot about um, young people who were pigeonholed as Generation Z or Z or Millennials or whatever, and that they have views about how uh, companies conduct themselves. And um, Stella, before you were saying we were kind of, the academia was behind the curve on thinking about um, engaging with the industry and, and learning technology. I mean, is it, is it possible for academia and, and fashion courses to get a, ahead of the curve here with this idea of uh, personal you know, development with students? I think universities are already trying to, you know, um, engage with these issues now. So, uh, you know, probably in common with, um, you know, with college, you know, our our teaching now has to kind of consider all aspects of things like inclusivity. You know, so if you if you if you talk about um, uh, whether that's race, gender, disability, all of those sort of concepts are being discussed now and I think I think probably education has been in a position to drive some of those more than the you know quite effectively uh, you know in within the industry I think that's possibly one area you know in terms of those concepts that are quite um, maybe not so technically driven you know or about um, uh, we're not particularly scientific you know they're about behavior values ideas ethics um, you know, I think students have engaged really, really well. And in any, in any cohort, in cohort I've taught for the last sort of five to 10 years, those issues are being really well engaged with by students. You know, they're very passionate about them. Um, I think we also see, and I've, you know, I've taught on, on courses with placement years, you, you can get, you know, uh, you know, you get a lot of idealism growing from, from those topics and then you can get, and I'm just coming back to Zoe's suggestion about this kind of, this, this I don't know, this half world that, that she's kind of envisaging, you know, that, that, that move into industry can be quite sort of, um, it can be a bit, of, a bit shocking for them to realise what the that the industry maybe doesn't embody some of those values when they get into it and I think it can be a bit of a, a shock for students you know whether it's about things like um, how how people working in the supply chain are treated or how diversity is thought about within a, a business you know even even to the makeup of the main board or you know how women are treated or or whatever, or or um, or whether it's you know the, the culture of copying and the ethics around that that um, Gabby was just talking about, you know that some of these things can be a real wake up call for the students. And so I think you know we 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 do put, we do already sort of put 
put a lot of emphasis on those kind of values and ethics or well, I think we could go further like, like with everything um, you know um, so we just mentioned about sort of values which is really important so the idea of education for sustainable development very much is based on that idea of sustainability literacy and an understanding of where we are with you know our planet and, and what it can cope with and also being able to um, empowering students uh, with the confidence and the ability to question and critique what is happening when they go into that industry. Um, yeah, and, and obviously hopefully give them the tools and the, and the skills to be able to provide solutions as well. So I do think we are on that journey. I think, you know, I think it, it's written into all of our strategic plans, things like that. And I think it's, it's going to be again because of this situation we're in now, even more emphasised uh, within all of our university courses in fashion. Can I, just, okay. can I just add something in there? Um, I would think one of the things that I was really noticing was um, when we were together on the Ravensbourne Denim Posse, um, was how many of those students, and this is this is really a defining thing, I think. It's like, those, so many students, and I know that Gabby, you were saying before, it's like they've all got their own sort of racket going on on the side. And when I was at, when I was at college, you to get to get extra money, you were working in the pub or working as a waitress or, you know, working in the cinema. Though that's kind of was your, like, you know, financial gain options, pretty much. Whereas nowadays, it's like having a sideline in like, uh, you know, sportswear resale or in a, you know, trainer market or building your own brand on the side. So I think what's really interesting is the power of Instagram has really brought in a marketplace and an agile business experience for those students before they even go out into training at, uh, at university or go out into the world to sit inside other people's business models so it's creating these people that are already going out there with their passion and creating brands that might be about sustainability might be about their music passion but it's already instilling that and they're going into the world having had their own experience about well this is my business model yours what is that that's not agile this is how we can change stuff and i think it's about sort of respecting that, that it's very, very different and business models are coming very much from this agile youth uh, where they are creating the new influencer brands. The influencer brands used to be like the big, you know, the big blue chip companies. Well, the agile younger market of, of sort of uh, entrepreneurial brands are the ones that are actually showing the way to go, well, actually, if we did it in this way and if we worked with artisans in this different field, we can change we can change the we can change the nature of business but, but that, that's a very interesting way of sort of looking from the ground up rather than like we're going to teach you what we need it's sort of yeah. like an inverted way of looking at it well, Sorry, I, so so gabby what, do you do you see that the, the students are enthused on this level is there you know really yeah. strong views that's exactly what i was about to say is they come in with these these values so we're not teaching them those values they do really come in with those values but then we're sort of like identifying them and help, helping to sort of like nurture them and then putting them into groups to try and make them flourish and so they can push their ideas as, as much as they can while they're at university um but we is we interview all of our students and we ask them questions around ethical fashion and sustainability and what it means to them um and sort of five six years ago lots of blank faces lots of like oh i'm really interested in the environment but i'm not really sure how it's impacted by the industry that i then want to go into and now i've got students coming in who've done sort of like research that some of my third years haven't found around raw materials around what it means for water usage within um within cotton growth for example and these are sort of like 17 year olds that i'm interviewing coming into you know the beginnings of the ba so i do I do believe that they are coming in with these really, really strong values instilled in them. Um, and so then when you're saying educating for industry needs or ed educating for personal societal good, they've got those values. They want to take them with them and they want to embed them in all of their projects and all of their work throughout their education and then into industry. The slight break we get is when if they go into industry and then they feel disillusioned that they're not seeing what they believe to be really strong and important um, 
issues around sustainability or racial issues or ethical issues not being carried forward by the brands that they want to work with. So I do see students going, ah, I love this brand. And now I, you know, I, I don't align with where they're heading, but then surely their job would then be to go, I'm like, well, go and work for that brand <laughs> and then help direct it. I know that's a very blue sky way of thinking, but if that, that's what the aim is with our, with our, with educating the students, they can walk in and they can, um, be listened to because they've got they've got some cachet now that they're coming with them now more so than I definitely think when I went to the industry. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I ask you know in a funny way we're we're all talking about it quite in a linear way like assuming if you're young you're in education then you go into industry. So when you're 17 your kind of ambition and desire is one thing when you're 25 it shifts when you're 30 and onwards. But I think. I feel we're particularly coming out of this space. At the weekend, I spoke to three people who are all probably late 40s, early 50s, and they're all doing another MA. And I didn't realize it wasn't on purpose, but I was just like kind of impressed that actually I think we're at a point where, um, like I love this thing about wisdom and freedom. So actually kids going on a BA, they have this amazing freedom about the way that they think um and this ability to build uh without fear but they don't have experience and wisdom but if you can collide those two that becomes very powerful and so maybe education also we shouldn't be so linear about our that only starts at the beginning that actually we can all be educated at various different points and possibly that's the way the world will move to a better place so were you coming in before was it you what you were, what, I mean, sort of like, it feels like so much benefit of having this incredible passion and already this sort of like street led business knowledge to be able to launch that into that beautiful sort of like new world hub where you don't have to be on the front line of like, you know, the, the, the decision makers or you don't have to sit under a corporate ceiling that means mm. that you automatically become voiceless, mm. uh, which is numbing. We've all been there. Mm. Um, but that you actually can be part of this sort of creative hub that then gets filtered out into something different. Uh, it's just, I mean, I can think of the, the great, uh, you know, the institutions on the high street that used to have those creative areas. Um, I don't, what do they call them? Like tech labs or whatever they called them. But and that was where, you know, that incredible genius and the, the you know, the scientists and could really excel and have fun. And then it would be, filtered into oh that actually that's a great new product line initiative well that's a this so it would be nurtured and supported to go forward yeah i, I mean i i really personally i really think the the idea of you know this this idea of personal and societal good uh, ethical things sustainable things under, if if they if students can understand that I think it only it only really pushes them on to um, learn the kind of the the more mundane aspects of their academia on 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 uh, design or anything else um, more strongly. And what I maybe I'm not articulating this right, but I a few years ago I was asked to go and speak at a high school in Los Angeles completely unplanned i was over there on business and a friend of my colleague said can you come and speak about sustainability to this this uh, these students so we went to this part of la um which was not very nice i would describe it and um we got there about 3 30 in the afternoon and i was expecting all these students to be leaving in the afternoon leaving for the end of the day nobody was leaving and I went in there, and to cut a long story short, um, this school had been what they called, this school was a failing school. You know, no, no achievement of qualifications, truancy at, you know, over 50%. Uh, and a local woman, a visionary, went to the education authorities and said, please let me run the school, let me, um, let me design the curriculum. And, and give me some money to do it. And basically, the curriculum was created around everything to do with sustainability. And so 
their English lessons might be something about writing a plan about how you create a sustainable garden. Mm -hmm. Their math lesson was about accounting, how you might yeah. account to for that. And within 12 months, they had totally engaged students. They completely turned it round. I saw, you know, student council there, people working in the gardens, 50 kids came to watch me talk, and they were totally engaged because they absolutely saw the relevance to their lives. So I think this, this aspect about, you know, fueling people's um, uh, feelings about societal good can only be positive right across academia. And if, if that type of person is going into the industry, that can only be beneficial for us all. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, especially at academia level, that this thing is really nurtured and fostered. Um, so that, that's such an amazing story, but that you're talking about learning, not teaching. That subtle difference, I think, well, is quite, very powerful. Quite. Very quite. powerful. Okay, well... I think we'll 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 take a couple of questions now. Um, we had a question that came in early, um, a few hours ago actually. So I'm going to ask that question first. Uh, have we any more other questions, Mosin? Three more have come, have like have like come in. Okay, so this is from um, a lady in Hong Kong called Marianne, and she asks, how can graduates be better prepared for industry? We are, we are facing now, uh, oh, sorry, prepare for industry we are now facing, and how do companies help nurture and develop new graduates? The leap between graduating and the first job is getting bigger and more challenging. So how can students prepare for this? So, Mohsin, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I learned on the job. You know, I, I, I was a trained fashion designer. I did both men's and ladies, and then, um. I went into a job and I only got the job because I was good at Photoshop. It's the most strangest thing. You know, it wasn't what well, they didn't even look at me for my design skills. I said, can you do Photoshop? I went, yeah, they go, come in. So it may be now, maybe now <laughs> they'll probably get students coming or can you do 3D CAD or whatever, whatever the newest technology is and those students are going to get it. So it's just more about being ahead of being quite relevant. If there's some software or some way of designing, which you think is ahead of the curve, try and learn it. Um, that's what the kind of advice I would give and, and, and research the, the one area you like. Now, obviously I went into denim, but I consider myself a designer, first of all. So um, I specialized in denim, but maybe it's a case of maybe specializing in a couple of different areas that might help you more rather than being a general designer saying, no, I'm really good at knit, knit or whatever. You specialize in one sub, sub subject and you advertise yourself as that. That's the advice I would give and, and try and do something that you really enjoy as well in that subject. That's a good advice. Anybody else like to contribute? Well, yeah, I was, I was just thinking that sometimes you come out of college and you expect that you're going to go, you know, straight to the head of Burberry or, you know, your expectation is that you're already going to land straight in the prime seat that you dreamt of. And, and it's just not like that. It's stepping stones. And sometimes those stepping stones take you away from where you want to go. And sometimes it teaches you, actually, that was definitely a no. I'm going back over here. And uh, I remember once going for an interview and it was somebody that was a friend of mine who worked at Gucci, got me an interview with a guy at Gucci. And as I was talking through, he looked down at my CV and he was like, if you'd have told me right at the start that you'd done wig making in the back of a <laughs> in uh, near, near where you guys are, he was like, I would have got you in straight away. I would never have thought of actually claiming that because he was just like, that's just so weird. Um, so actually, it's there. There are so many. It's it's also about the passion that you bring to the room, and if you're just learning something that is a homogenous tool. You're not going to bring anything. You have to bring all of yourself. If you're a potter, you have to bring all of the chaos and explain explain what's great about that chaos. What's mm. great about the chaos theory that runs your life? Well, it's about experimentation, and experimentation creates so much more beauty and unusualness. And if that's the wrong the wrong audience, it's not going to happen. If it's the right audience, kaping. Mm. That's lovely. It's like passion and commitment. Um, <clears throat> but I, I also think just to add in, I think. Um, yeah, I think we have to think, again, going back to time, and time is all sort of dissolving right now for all of us. But yeah, that leap is bigger. I come back to my weird space in between. I think <clears throat> when in debt, celebrate, you know, when in 
sort of recessions invest. I would love to see investment that would be a global kind of trail that would um, could move between uh, countries and cultures um, where it sits between academia and industry. I think there's a portal there that <clears throat> doesn't have to have an academic qualification. It's an inter, it's a new space. Um, <clears throat> so that's not, that needs to be discussed and we need to say in every single webinar until someone invests in it. But I think thinking about time, that uh, it's okay for them, you can, you can, so start your education and you can actually have some space out before you go back in. I think sometimes you don't realize how good you are at something until you've taken space away from it, if that makes sense. So I would also suggest not to feel um, anxious about not getting that perfect position straight away and maybe doing other things that could um, just add to your own self and your own understanding. Other areas that you want to um, engage with um, before you think about going deep into an industry that might dry you out. I've got one one point to add, which is about understanding the like the roles and the spaces in the industry that are actually available to you, having just de depending on what you've studied, um, because there is a whole tranche of roles which I think lots of people discount. I know this panel yeah. doesn't, but within um, manufacturing and supply, uh, based in the UK as well, um, and just roles that might not have sort of um, design attached to it or buying attached to it, but they have got, they are so, they're going to be so interesting, so innovative. Um, so I think it's really sort of like digging around the industry and seeing what those other roles are. Like we, we talk about it quite a lot on our course, but, and I'm sure the other courses do, but it is for the graduates to make sure I think the students right now have had the rug pulled from underneath their feet. I totally, you know, they're like, I was planning on this and it's gone. I've got year twos who can't go on a placement. I've got year threes who are staring at, you know, empty inboxes. Um, so they are having to think on their feet um, and reposition themselves, which is actually going to be of great benefit to them in the future. It's just really difficult to see that right now, I think, as, yeah. as a as a student who's about to graduate graduate i can i can say to them look you've got actually you're going to be so agile you're going to be the most amazing graduate ever but they're like it feels different it feels you know what i was looking for isn't quite there so i think looking across the industry and looking sideways into lots of different areas to see where your skills still align is really really relevant right now for all those graduates i think the question also might be coming from a, a, a perspective of somebody from the industry looking at the 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 the, the gap between the, the expectations of a graduate and what what they're getting so it's not clear from the mm. question whether it's a, is it a skills thing is it a kind of is it about communication mm. is it about team working it's not clear from the question what what the what the questioner feels is missing i think zoe's mentioned that there is this kind of um you know there is this big leap between graduating and the expectations not just the, the jobs but the expectations of the industry where maybe 20 30 years ago there would have been much more investment from companies in training people and not expecting graduates to come with every single skill for their particular business for their particular product sector of the market so i think i think that companies also need to look at at how they you know what their graduate roles are and how they're supported um and um and, and you know we're all working for universities that emphasize employability live projects placements we do everything we can to try and prepare our students for employment but we cannot provide a perfect fit for every job you know we can't do that and so there maybe needs to be some more meaningful research about what these perceptions are from industry in relation to what the graduates are coming with. I'm not aware that there's a massive amount of research going on into that, but if that is a, an issue, we need to maybe define it somehow. And so again, it's coming back to collaboration and filling some of those spaces up with something meaningful for both us as universities, the students and for industry. I also think you can take a slower journey. Like, I mean, I was, I met Mawson when he was doing his BA and then I met him years later and he'd gone off and done another bit of denim teaching, um, education in America. Then he'd done some in Japan, met people along the way, done odd things. And 
look at him now. I mean, but it doesn't all, he doesn't become more sin of today when he first left college. And I think it's about enjoying your life and the adventure and moving through things and um, keeping that ambition alive. But the good things never come in the obvious places. <laughs> they always come and you have to have, um, again, keep that uh, positivity alive and keep your learning smart and be open to potentially kind of coming at something from a different angle is what I would say as well. And, and maybe get into wig making. That seems yeah. to be <laughs> <laughs> one more thing to add. <laughs> one more thing to add as well, just just on the students' point of view. It's like when I when I graduated, I didn't get a job straight away and I ended up actually going to a company that I liked and asking, can I work for you for free? And all, I managed to negotiate that they paid my travel card. That's what I did. So, you know, and I did that for nine months until a role opened up. So it may be a case of you just giving yourself, making sure that your CV is not blank and you've been working in Tesco's for nine months. Think, you're actually think, are keeping busy. I think that's a real difference though, because that was something that we could do. I mean, we, we almost didn't expect to go into roles that were paid. Yeah. Or, I mean, a minimum of two to five years, possibly. Whereas nowadays, I think the HR teams are so sort of, it's almost like they, uh, they've become like a, I don't know, a gatekeeper for that because it, they're not allowed to bring people in that aren't they? So actually companies have a greater expectation of graduates because they're paying. They're paying yeah. a minimum wage or they're paying a something. So whereas they could have employed a lot more students to give them just like general experience for three months and get them to help out on projects, it's a very different thing now because you've got all the contracts, you've got all the extra budget that you've got to find from somewhere. So those spaces aren't as available as they used to be. So Plus in one they're way... They're paying for their degrees as well. So they are financially supporting themselves through university. I, I think you know, it's a good it's, thing that apprenticeships are paid for. I think it's really positive and I think we have to move into a new space. But you as a company, if you've got a little big profit, you should have a budget for that period. And I think um, that that shouldn't be an expectation that people work for nothing. Regardless, I mean, you know, you can't, you can't educate 20 years of experience into someone. So, um, I, we all know that. I just think it's 2020 in this reflective space and it's an amazing space for us to really think how do we not mend what was broken in the past but how do we make new systems and new values that are evidently require people who wants to just do a degree and be a copyist and you know I think when we talked and we met earlier a couple of weeks back we talked about the kind of passion of what comes out of fashion education on all the different roles that there's this kind of these curious, amazing problem solving creatures, whether you're good at detail or material or design or fit or, or supply chain. I think you layer that now with material scientists and digital thinking and people who are obsessed with where the fiber began or this is a magical thing that I think is a privilege to be in education. Evidently Michael and his two stories, both coming to Ravenswood and going to LA, that fed him, it excited him. And, I think we need to allow that period to remain that positive and yeah, not try and be up, so down on the fact that there's this big gap, try and be more um, yeah, tenacious about knowing that, yeah, we will make that difference and they will make a difference and they have that power and confidence to just change things. And I think that's to focus upon. Okay. So Mawson, do you want to, Shall we choose one last question? Yeah, there's a few here. As someone said, right. she completely agrees with what, about unpaid internships. She's saying you know, to create a gap between the students and privilege compared to, yeah, it's, so one person agrees with, uh, with like Zoe. And then another one saying agree to teach validity uh, in, in, like reality, in, in like reality to buyers and designers going through suppliers, asking them to copycat it's cheaper. And this is a question, I think. Um, there is still a vast difference between designers and makers in factories. Will VR help designers show makers more? Maybe Zoe or, or, or can jump on here. I know you guys, or, and even Gabby, maybe, I don't know. Is the VR playing a big part in what you guys are doing at, at the RCA? I know you, you, you and I were laughing recently that it's 30 different ways of doing 3D CAD drawings at the moment. So it's not even. Yeah. Um, I think, um, uh, I think there are definitely amazing tools in the digital that will um, help the supply chain be smaller, 
help new economies, help micro businesses. But when it comes to the physicality, there probably still needs um, better cloth simulation and there needs to be haptic tools. So yeah, do we want to, would we rather have dolphins in Venice and sea fish in the canals? Yes. Tick. Um, so if we don't want to fly so much, we need to invest in those tools so that we can go back to, you know, dealing with some samples in the real and, and very focused moments because I think the real is essential. We are real material. I mean, particularly around denim, you know, you know, my love of denim, it's durable, full of memory. It's, you know, you want to touch that, you want to feel it. But I do think uh, there's a massive space that is underinvested uh, and was underinvested by a bigger fashion industry when they went global and made a chunk of change that um, we now need to see that helps not just with VR, but AR and haptic and all those spaces that has it become design tools, become tools for us to really maximize and allow the industry not to allow us to enjoy the beauty of nature and the silence of the skies. Um, tick, tick, tick. I think that there's one more question. Uh, the Industry Association ASBCI has been fighting a losing battle recently due to years, years to get students and staff involved with in the industry networking events. What can academics do to encourage such involvement, giving students focus a cert, I can't say the word, modules, part-time work or fees? I don't know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, someone else can ask that question. I don't know. Uh, just, to, uh, just to come in on that, I mean, you know, I'm older than all of you there, and they, 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 there used to be a network and, and um, regional meetings uh, for members of the Textile Institute as well, and that used to be a real fervent, you know, bed of, in, uh, you know, information and networking, and um, I think it's a really important function, and unfortunately, those things used to be based more to do with the physical industry in this country that's disappeared. But I think that that really could be something positive going forward. Mm. I don't know what anybody else thinks about it. Well, our course is accredited by the Textile Institute. So we have to do a certain amount of textile learning to get that accreditation. And then the students can then apply to be part of the Textile Institute. Um, and the Textile Institute have been super, really helpful with resources. But it is, it has been, because it was based around what was essentially, yeah, the um, industry within the UK, it has maybe lost some of its, like, innovation and push. Like, the, for the students, they don't necessarily go to their Texas Institute and see, like, um, a space of innovation, even though there is so much knowledge there that could be harnessed. And I think the part of that is us as universities working, but it's also engaging the students about this, this, the question that was just asked as well. Um, showing the, the sort of like the importance of these events like if you are being invited to a an industry event not just from a retail or a brand but from an industry body explaining why these industry bodies are so important and so important to engage with but making sure that the students are also um, getting getting something valid from it as well because these industry bodies can be a really good bridge between industry and academia um, but they're not I don't think they're being utilized as well as they could be on probably on both sides I would say. Yes I would agree with that um, and I think they also suffer to a certain extent from the same image issue as aspects of the supply chain. I don't know what the solution is mm. um, but it, it is trying to make them as you say more relevant or, or somehow building an understanding of the relevance and the benefits of engaging with them because I mean I've you know I I'm get, I go regularly to ASBCI events as a as a lecturer. Um, I know it's very hard to get students to go to the student conference. Um, I, I it's I don't understand why sometimes students don't want to go. They, they have very good speakers. They have brilliant presentations. I'm not I'm not sure what the problem is. I'm really not sure. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, but it is something worth thinking about how we can engage with 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 our particularly our uk based platforms and associations because you know one another thing that the the recent pandemic has shown us is you know how we've we, we've actually you know we've got pockets of manufacturing in this country that have really responded to some of the issues around you know provision of ppe and how that has kind of sort of sparked conversations and, and sort of an understanding about 
reliance on global supply chains and really there's an opportunity here you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> let's have that discussion now and try and make you know that that sort of a relevant thing that people can get behind and also get these these industry associations involved with pushing as well um so i think all sorts of opportunities are going to come out of this situation but i think you know we're all in reality we're all going to be in a situation where we're dealing with some real challenges next year you know us as academics supporting students we were just talking before this session started about all the challenges around you know how things are going to be delivered next year we've got an awful lot to think about but you know these things do need to happen and we're also going to be in a situation where people are going to be concerned about budgets and money in reality Mm. in the industry and in academia um but you know like zoe says out of those sort of straightened circumstances you can get new thinking innovation yeah and you know uh, maybe more of a kind of will and a push to to drive meaningful change well on that note (laughs) i would say that uh, meaningful change is round the corner i would hope i mean you know, we hear the word reset uh, every other day in the news about industry and, every, and our lives. And potentially this is probably going to be the most exciting time in our industry the next few years. Um, and um, so I'm really looking forward to what will happen in terms of technology, in terms of sustainability, in terms of onshoring, how we engage with that. Um, and I'd just like to finish up by thanking you all. Thank you, Stella, Zoe, Gabby, Sue, Mosin. And um, we uh, will wrap it up there. And just for anybody who's listening, if you are an educator or used to be, or you're a student, you're a graduate, and you have strong views about this, we're very much open to having another webinar. So. If you've got strong enough views, come and get in touch with us and maybe we run this again. But for now, thank you and goodbye. Bye. Guys, thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Bye bye. Bye guys. Thank you so much for your time.